Looking at the KRE, which is Spider S&P Regional Banking ETF, it's off 1.1% today. Year to date, it's off 36%. You know, I've been going back and forth. Is this a crisis? Is just a turmoil? Is just a stress? I, I don't know. Uh, it goes different days, but it's certainly having an impact on the market. We want to check in with the professionals and see how they're kind of factoring that in. David Bonson, CIO of the Bonson Group. Hey, David, thanks so much for joining us here. I mean, it's not every day we get a banking crisis here, if that's what it is. How is kind of the, you know, the turmoil we've seen in the banking system, how's that impacted your outlook at all, if, if at all, in, in terms of investing here? Well, I think that as dividend growth investors, I don't necessarily see a macro impact to the way that we're allocating. We, we want companies that are still growing dividends, whether there's a regional bank saga or any other type of you know distressed event. I do think when you say it's not every day we get a banking crisis, that we should basically point out it's never happened that we get a banking crisis when nobody is missing any payments. Yep. All banking crisis, all financial panics, always are credit impairment events. And this isn't. And it's utterly fascinating that we've had three banks go down with nobody missing any payments, no loan deterioration or, or credit distress, purely interest rate driven phenomena, liquidity, a really unprecedented moment for financial distress. So, David, are you advising clients to buy the dip on any of these bank shares right now? Well, the one that we bought and bought heavily is Truist, the ticker mm. TFC, um, because we really don't think it belongs in the list of regionals, and yet it is down on the year. Now, I should be clear, it's down 33% and not, you know, 70, 80, 90, like some of the uh, PacWest and these others that have gotten really hammered. But uh, Truist is really, in a lot of ways, more like a J.P. Morgan than it is a PacWest. I mean, nobody's J.P. Morgan in terms of sheer size, but it was BB&T and SunTrust that merged together. They're kind of a super regional with ample liquidity. Their deposit base is not eroded, and yet they've gotten hit. So we want to look to those opportunities where maybe someone threw a little baby out with bathwater and it created a value opportunity. So, I mean, it kind of goes to the, the, I'm not sure how you feel about this, but a lot of concern out there is maybe some of the stress on the regional banks will just hasten, you know, tighter credit conditions and then really uh, accelerate or hasten a, a recession and maybe the depths of the recession. Do you see that kind of scenario playing out? Well, I think it's entirely possible, but I'd look to one step beyond that. It's also possible that that ends up being the catalyst that forces the Fed to throw in the white flag, uh, to wave the white flag. I think that um, they've been acting for some time as if they were going to keep going until they broke something, and this may very well be the thing that they broke. Now, people who are looking at it saying there's going to be less residential lending, I think they're missing what's really going on there on the demand side and the affordability side. Prices just simply had to come down there, and there's ample equity in the homeowners market. I don't think that's a systemic event. We've been talking about commercial real estate forever, and that's one of the great, most bullish things you could say is when everybody's talking about it, there's no way it's a systemically bad event. Um, it's never happened that the, the number one story people talk about, usually in this case, treating industrial and multifamily buildings as if they're the same thing as an abandoned office building in Portland, Oregon. There's just um, not a monolithic thing called commercial real estate. So what would the systemic impact be? I think it's small business. I think that if you really do see credit tighten enough at a small business level, that could end up hitting labor markets, wages, corporate profits, and that's usually what we call a recession. And beyond even just when we're talking about the bank stocks, what other corners of the market are you snapping up right now? And which corners do you think are still just more vulnerable at this point? Yeah, I do think that um, we have been really good in uh, the way we picked up consumer staples. I wouldn't say that it's screaming cheap now, but the thesis we had a year ago that they were going to maintain pricing power and these were products people still had to buy. And so even if volumes dipped, prices would stay the same and they would ultimately end up with margin expansion. Um, so I think consumer staples has proven to be a great story. Uh, energy is our number one sector. Obviously, it was up huge in 2021 and 2022. This year, it has not done as well, and yet midstream has hung in there 
just fine, still up on the year for the pipelines, and you're getting 6 7% dividend yields. Um, on financials, though, I want to point out that everyone talks about financials like they're banks. And I think asset managers have something really interesting to offer here. You look at Blackstone and Apollo. We don't own KKR. I know they released yesterday. Um, but some of these fee-based asset managers that are somewhat rate sensitive, a lot of that was priced in last year. I think they have a ton of leverage in their operating models to do really good things from here. Apollo is one of the names you just mentioned. What's the play right there? Because I think they're moving into private wealth uh, which I know is, A, it's an attractive business, but it's also a very uh, you know, competitive business. Well, the thing is very interesting, and this is sort of like where I feel sometimes like we have inside information because I run a nearly $4.5 billion private wealth firm, and I've been with Blackstone for 12 years and watched them enter private wealth from the ground up and do it extremely well, very, very profitably. And Apollo is a little bit late, but they're really good at what they do. And I think that uh, we're watching Apollo do all the right things for distribution, for product development. Uh, it's a profitable space. There's a lot of uh, opportunity there. And if we're right on a macro level that we're not going to be in a decade of a screaming bull market in stocks and bonds like the post-financial crisis decade was, then I think you're going to see more people go back to alternatives, more uh, kind of bespoke product, private credit, real estate, hedge funds, some of the things that places like Apollo and Blackstone do really well. And I think there are those two in particular in a unique position to do well with private wealth. You mentioned the pipeline stocks. And what's interesting when I think about energy, people have brought up the concern about whether value in that corner of the market can still hold up as we see inflation begin to continue to fall. But what is it specifically about pipelines that might diversify a little bit more? And obviously, you mentioned the dividend growth there, that other potential corners of energy might not be able to deliver as much. Well, it's fascinating to me that when we're dealing with, let's call it 70 to $90 oil, and we had that um, at a couple other points in the last decade, and some of those pipeline companies were paying out over 100% of free cash flow and dividends. Right now, the average in our portfolio, and as far as really well-run midstream type companies people could buy, has 160% coverage of their distribution. They're using way less leverage. They don't have to sell equity to fund CapEx. And frankly, they're not doing as much CapEx. They're not overbuilding, overinvesting. There's a lot more capital discipline. So you basically have better fundamentals with companies behaving better, um, and you still have a really attractive yield spread. So the pipelines to us have less commodity sensitivity than upstream producers and drillers, and yet even better fundamentals. So just 30 seconds, uh, David, what's the call that you, you're making that no one else really gets, maybe? Well, that's a permanent uh, answer, uh, <laughs> dividend, di di dividend growth. I think people yep. continue to believe they can buy a whole index or constantly buy FANG and technology and get a market return. And they don't understand that they're buying at very high multiples, praying for higher multiples. And then you, the worst thing is sometimes you get them and you think you know what you're doing. And the reality is, Multiples revert to the mean. A dividend growth is about free cash flow generation, and I just think it's an entirely different way to think about investing. So that's what we do all the time, and it is different. It is contrarian, and yet a lot of people right now like the idea of more defensive investments, more stable business models. So I can't say enough about the overall world of dividend growth. All right, David, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate getting your perspective, giving us some time. David Bonson, he's the CIO of the Bonson Group, talking stocks, talking markets here. Um, again, he's had a lot of experience at UBS and Morgan Stanley, so we appreciate getting some of his time.